available to provide continuing education and some of that stuff might come from the CDC or you know from wherever else that sort of compiles the best practices for you know child care providing um, and then the consultants would also provide this sort of ongoing technical assistance like if you needed to have a different kind of ground for your underneath your playground or something like that because you know they change safety standards and you know the grass that you had one year may need to be mulch and you know kind of stuff like that and then at the end of this whole process the child care center does another self-assessment and see sees if they've improved um, and so you know they, they approached our company and the design team that we work with and they wanted to redesign their website that they had originally set up, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And it looked, you know, kind of old and it looked a little abandoned. And so the other aspect of it is that they really wanted to provide an online delivery system for this. And they thought that it would be, you know, a pretty, with the ubiquity of the internet, you know, that it would be easier and, you know, more efficient in a sense to be able to provide this sort of the self-assessment and the action planning to these daycare centers, you know, through the web. And so, we thought about it, and since we are a Plon shop mainly, we said, okay, well, we can use Plone, but there, there were other reasons for actually doing it. That you know, They had a bunch of content that they actually wanted to provide, and a big part of this was that they wanted to also put some of the ongoing continuing education onto the web, so they wanted to record you know, videos of lectures and you know, various other resources that they could provide to people, and so they wouldn't necessarily always have to call on a technical consultant. You know, daycare people could, log into the website and perhaps look at a lecture or something like that to have their continuing education provided for them. Um, so there were CMS aspects of it. The other thing that you know, came out of the requirements was that there were gonna be a lot of different roles and permissions and Plone we think has a very good you know, sort of established way of doing that. It's extensible, it's there already, the, the security is granular and so we could provide that sort of thing out of the box. Um, since they wanted a nice new theme and they wanted to design it, you know, using standard web technologies like HTML and CSS, and we figured, you know, Diazo is definitely the way to do it. And um, we also kind of determined that, you know, from their set of requirements, particularly the action planning and the self-assessments, that we would just use dexterity for um, the content types. And we figured each one of the different types of assessment would be a content type and, you know, kind of translated it that way. Um, the other thing that, you know, that made us really veer towards using Dexterity, besides the fact that we know it's the future of Plone, is that we knew that they would have a sort of a customized registration process, and we wanted to use EC3's form for that. Um, so, you know, we just essentially, those, those were our criteria and the, and the decisions that we made to, to use Plone. Um, you know, delivering a web app through Plone, it, it veers a little bit from our usual use case, which is to provide you know, CMS functionality. And so we were really using it as a framework, which you know, is extending a little bit how we normally use Plone. I mean, not, not completely, because it's not within, you know, outside of the use case of it, but you know, we had debated using Pyramid or Django or something else you know, in the Python sort of web technology, but we decided that there was enough you know, out of the box goodness in Plone that we felt it was a reasonable decision to make. Um, we, we still feel that way for the most part. Um, and so, anyway, so moving on to the, you know, the amount of stuff it turned out that we needed to develop for Knapsack turned out to be a little higher than we had imagined. And as we get, as usual, as you get through and start doing the analysis, you start seeing like, well, you need to, we needed to have a little bit more of, you know, content types and, you know, the, I think one of the bigger challenges with it was deciding what the actual vocabulary that the Knapsack group was providing to us and how we translated that because, you know, they have sort of a, you know, specific language that they're used to using and then, you know, us as outsiders are trying to pick it apart and figure out how that translates into a more software sort of thing. But uh, so we ended up, you know, with about four different, three different content types really, um, the self-assessments, the action plan, and then the individual action plan steps. Um, the action plan steps are actually kind of, you know, small, and, and they're, as you could imagine, just a piece of text uh, with a couple extra attributes on it. The action plan itself, since it was, you know, composed of all the action plan steps, but it also had a specific goal, and so we had to sort of map that 
between the vocabulary that Knapsack used, and that was, that was the biggest one. And then the self-assessments is actually where most of our development time got put into. Um, there are other aspects of it as well, like they designed this application, the web application, for, you know, essentially they wanted to uh, appeal to people who are not necessarily uh, web literate or perhaps another way of describing it is they want to provide the services to the daycares in perhaps um, places that need their services the most. So the, a lot of the employees that they were, they, they were targeting maybe, not, maybe don't have a lot of education, may not, you know, they may have to access it through a slower internet connection and, or stuff like that, although that was less of it. But it was, it was really like they wanted to make it foolproof that it was very obvious what you needed to do at each step. And, and um, so they ended up with a lot of landing pages, which um, they have five different landing pages for this, which I feel is just a little bit more than you need, and we'll probably pare that down. But you know, as, as you know, people start using it, we'll get feedback and continue the development cycle like that. But um, you know, it, it, they really wanted to make it so that almost anyone could use it. And I think that they were, the, we were pretty successful in that. Um, it, it's fairly obvious as you step through the flow of, that, of the web app what you're supposed to do at each point, for the most part. Um, so anyway, the self-assessments is really where we spend a lot of time. Um, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more technical because we had to do something that, you know, things that we, you don't necessarily always think of doing right away when you start developing content types. I mean, generally you think of them as like an event or a page or something like that where you have an ad form and it's blank and you're expected to fill in content right there. This was a little bit different because as soon as you create an assessment, you know, having a blank assessment isn't really that useful. Like, it has all the widgets, like the check boxes and, you know, the radio buttons and stuff and the way to answer questions, but it, it directs immediately, you know, the ad form just redirects to the edit form because you want it to be edited right away. You don't want to actually just save an empty thing, an empty assessment. You can, but, you, but, you know, we just had it redirect immediately to the edit form. Um, so the other thing that's, you know, kind of, complicated about it was that each question can be tailored in two different ways. And one of them is through the set of roles and permissions that you can have in Plone and that you know, the user is, assi is assigned that, that set of roles and the permissions along with it. But the other way is through what you actually answer on a previous question. And so they're trigger questions. And in some cases, when you answer a question, you know, other ones will disappear or you won't be fed. So there's a little bit of branch logic in there. Um, there are five different self-assessments, and they are the child nutrition, uh, breastfeeding and infant feeding, outdoor play and learning, screen time, and physical activity. And each one of the questions in there, like I said, has its own permission on it. And each, and then some of the questions will have the same sort of JavaScript, JavaScript trigger. It will be a, a trigger question that you know, is dynamically updated depending on answers to previous questions. Um, the, uh, the other very nice sort of technical thing that I felt about using Dexterity and the version of Dexterity that we use is that it shipped with Grok by default, and so it made it very easy for us to um, include alternate views on the content right there within the class. Um, that, uh, that actually turned out to be really important because after you complete a self-assessment, there's a number of different views that you need to go through in order to generate the action plan. And so not only does it have to be scored, but you also have to take into consideration whether or not a particular question was presented or whether or not a whole section of things was presented. You know, For example, if your daycare only services kids that are between the ages of three to five, you probably don't need to have you know, a lot of information about breastfeeding infants in your, you know, so it all had to sort of take that into consideration. And so we ended up with a, a you know, nine different views on the content once it was actually, once you completed the self-assessment. And so you have section results, the summary, you know, what the action plan is, which is related directly to a particular question within your self-assessment. 
you know, a section view, your focus areas, that you, the things you want to look at, you know, the goals within those focus areas, and then the, actually cre the creation of the action plan and then the management of the action plan. Um, so there, you know, there, there was a, that was why there's so much time spent with developing the, uh, the assessment. Um, this was, these are the 38 custom permissions that we ended up with. And so we were provided a spreadsheet with all the questions in it. And so for each permission that was in there, we had to derive the opposite as well. So you might be a particular type of child care provider, you know, where you provide services in the home. But in order for us to actually show things to people who weren't that, we had to have the, you know, the exact opposite. So, you know, you couldn't just do it by, you know, excluding like if you didn't have that because we had to specify the permissions per field. And so we, we sort of found that out a little bit late into the, into the development of it. Like we thought that it would be, you know, kind of like you could use Boolean logic, but it turns out you have to be very explicit with it, you know, which, which would stand to reason once you thought about it. Um, so yeah, those permissions are provided to you. They're assigned to you based on you know another registration form. Um, one of the other things that we had to do in order to provide the tooltips, which are, which you can see here, right there, um, is we had to do we had to make a custom widget, and that's not terribly difficult to do. The problem that we ran into is that the way that you the way that the documentation says that you can do it did not seem to work, and so we had to do a big override. And so wherever that widget is used, it now has the ability to have random, you know, to have arbitrary HTML in it, which isn't a problem because this is going to be, you know, used on one server only. Really, you know, we're not going to host another plone site within this instance. But you know, having to use overrides.zcml is, is a little bit upsetting, you know, in some ways. And we couldn't just, in, you know, do the widget Chrome. Um, so the, uh, the self-assessment it, itself is actually comprised of a number of different files. And this was you know, probably the most complicated content type that I've developed. And I've been working with Plone for quite a while. And uh, you know, so you, have the, you, know, you define the interface with the schema in it, which has all the permissions listed out for, per field and you know, the form widget hints and all that. But then because you don't in order for us to you know, sort of handle some of the complexity of it, we separated out a bunch of different things into separate files that get pulled in at different times. And so each base content type consists of you know, four, four different files. Um, you know, like I say, the base class has the schema with the interface. And then we also have the question separated out into a separate dictionary, into a dict and a file that gets pulled in and you know, the key is pulled in at the right time. And then the way that the, the self-assessment is essentially graded or scored, it needs to display your answer and then the best practice. And so, it, you know, because the, the idea, of course, is that you will always do the best practice, that you're, you're striving to make the best practice happen. And so, you know, that gets pulled out into a separate thing. And then in order for us to have all of the answers, you know, in some sort of cohesive fashion, we generated a bunch of little classes and turned them into a static vocabulary, which gets read in. And again, we had to do a little bit of modification in order to allow it to present, you know, arbitrary HTML to get the, um, tooltips into, into everything. And then the tooltips are just scattered throughout. Like they got a little bit excited about needing tooltips. Their initial um, user testing showed that people really liked them. And so they wanted more. And so we ended up <laughs> adding more and more, <laughs> more and more tooltips, which, you know, that, that's fine. Um, the other thing that, you know, we also determined is that, that in order to get the requirements just right, we actually had to have a, a fairly you know, complicated <laughs> workflow on a number of, on, on both the action plan and the uh, self-assessment. The self-assessment's a little bit you know, more clear cut because it, you, know, you start it and it's in progress and then when you complete it, it's done. And then, but when it's done, you can no longer edit it. And that was one of the things that they said is that you can have an endless amount of them, but you need to be able to only go back and view it. And once it, you know, because you, you know it's technically not really a grade, it's really whether or not you're getting closer to a best practice. You know, it's it's not so much of a not so much of a big deal. But the the workflow for the action plan is is fairly complicated because 
you would think that for a to-do list it would be pretty straightforward, but some of the you know, requirements really suggested. Anyway, so again, with the, the final thing that I really wanted to say about the developing the self-assessment code was that we found that because we had five of them, there was a lot of duplicate code. And the way that we developed this, this project is that they, you know, the, the clients, the Knapsack team wanted a single assessment that they could then, you know, disseminate to people and, and go for usability testing and see how things were. And so when you're just developing one and we were just, you know, getting the scoring algorithm right and all this, you know, it was, it was okay to have that stuff in there, but essentially each one is a duplicate of the other one with different text inserted. And we wanted, we had thought that we could be very clever about trying to handle, you know, maybe doing a dynamic schema or some other thing and only having a single content type. But ultimately, I, I think that our decision was that it's probably easier just to go with the convention. So what we noticed is after we had um, developed all five of these initially is that there were the exact same methods in each you know, for each one of these content types. And the most obvious thing that we could do is write adapters for all of them. And so it's like the, you know, when you find that tool that suddenly works, it was like suddenly we had dozens and dozens of these things because literally in almost every, every method was identical. There were a couple that, that weren't and those were left alone, but for the most part we were able to get, you know, adapters for getting the user's home folder, whether the question was asked to them, whether the section was there, you know, how the scoring worked, you know, was the section completed, which sections were presented, which I think I already said what the individual field score was. I mean, and so it was like all the, th all the commonalities were factored out into, a, into a, a single file that has a bunch of adapters in there, and that's probably the most adapters that I've ever written. And the nice thing about, you know, using Grok in this case was that I didn't have to write a bunch of ZCML in order to have that. It was really just a decorator right on top of it that said, you know, this is it. I don't know how people feel about Grok, but I kind of like it in some ways. Um, anyway, the next part of the, the development process was, you know, getting the action plan. And each goal that you would see that's up there in blue is, relates specifically to a question. And that's part of the action plan class. And then each one of the individual steps in there is actually an action plan step. And it's pre-canned, you know, like steps that would be the, the, the NAPSAC team that, you know, they would suggest that you follow, like if you're trying to achieve that particular goal. And you'll, you'll notice that there's a bunch of underlined stuff that indicates more tool tips in here that usability testing showed that they should have more tool tips, like adding more cowbell, right? And so th this, this, is a, this was a cool view to develop because it had a bunch of Ajaxy stuff in it. And so you can add a step and, you know, if you need to, you know, add a step, it's all user editable. You can edit the text, you can delete a step, you can reorder everything, and then you can add a helper name. And this is very much analogous to their paper form. And, um, you know, th this was by far, you know, the most enjoyable aspect of getting to do something neat, you know, on the, on the web app in, in a lot of ways because, you know, if it's Ajax, it's cool. So, you know, we got to do that. And, and, that, and that, was, that was pretty nice. Um, the, uh, the action plan itself has a workflow applied to it. However, an action plan step really doesn't. And so not that that really matters, but it was interesting, you know, that we're using a container you know, that has workflow to protect things that don't necessarily have a workflow on it. Um, you know, like I say, it was, it was uh, th this was by far the most, you know, heavily JavaScripty part of, of what we were doing. Um, so before I go on to the next aspect of it, is there any questions or any comments? Anything like that? Yeah, we worked with a design group um, called Rivers Agency, and they're local in the same town as we are, and they um, worked pretty extensively with the Knapsack group to, to get it. And, I, and I'll show the website itself at, towards the end of it so you can get a better idea of, of what it was. I wish I had a picture of what it looked like beforehand. I didn't even think about it, but they were very eager to see, you know, that, that, sort, of, that sort of go away. Um, so if there's nothing else, I'll move on. The next very big custom part of it was for the registration, and we had originally imagined that we could just sort of extend the existing registration form, but it turned out that 
there was a lot more to their registration process than we had initially anticipated. And so that permission XML file that I showed you, we needed to assign those permissions correctly to each person that registered. And it, and it also depends on who's registering. And so they, have, they essentially have three different types of people that can register for it. And they'll probably extend that out into a fourth. And you know, it's a teacher, a center owner, or a technical assistance provider. Um, currently, we only have one thing, you know, one type of user implemented for the initial rollout. That was what we had agreed on. But the same sort of, you know, thing will have to apply to all of them. You have to set up the permission matrix. There's a series of questions in the registration form that, you know, a user steps through that assigns things. And again, it's also tailored, you know, so that there's, a, you know, a JavaScript element to it. And then, you know, once the user's set up and created in there, um, we have to, we create groups and set up the folder where all the content is created. And so this is a perfect time to say, Plone API for the win. It made everything so much easier to just use API, you know, to create a user, to create a group, to assign a user to a group. It went from trying to remember the, ar you know, the arcane, how to do it with you know, adapters and all that stuff to, you know, simple four lines of code, really easy. The other part of the registration process that was, you know, it had to be bulletproof. And so we are big believers in, you know, automated testing. And so we had really started to, you know, set up a lot of tests for the self-assessment. But in, in the registration, you know, we extended ourselves and I wrote a very big robot framework suite of tests to, in order to, you know, basically do validation on the requirements. And then the unit tests had to be were basically written up front, like this was really, you know, an exercise in test-driven development because writing forms isn't particularly hard, but making sure that everything about them is exactly right and testing all the invariants and making sure your validation gets triggered correctly, you know, does have to be right. And this, this had to be right because with, when you have 38 different permissions that you have to deal with and some combination therein that has to be applied, you got to make sure that it works correctly. And so that, that was what a lot of the development effort went into was, was creating this test. And it, it's very rewarding to have, you know, that many tests, but it's also a very long process, especially writing robot framework tests. It's faster than other, you know, sort of selenium tests, but it's, it takes a little bit of thought in order to get just right. So a quick overview of, you know, what the registration did. You know, it's, it was all Z3C form which was nice because that's pretty easy to generate and we can you know, do stuff like that pretty quickly. The, uh, the permissions are all assigned right there. And so as you, go, as you step through the registration process, the user in the group is created and the user gets the roles and you know, the permissions are all set up for you. And then the, the other sort of interesting part about this is that the user's home folder is technically the group folder, and so more than one person can create content in this particular folder. And so not that that's difficult in Plone because you have local permissions, but we had to, you know, also assign all that stuff, you know, upon creation and then be able to go back and, you know, if you register as part of the same center so you could have multiple teachers, then that person has to get added to that center group and, you know, so we have this sort of hierarchical setup for it. Um, the, uh, and, and again, you know, in order to make registration work correctly, we had you know a big unit test suite, and that include the robot framework tests. And the ro robot framework tests really you know did a lot of other things besides make sure that you could click through the form and made sure that the right picture showed up in the right place. It made sure that the buttons you know traversed to the next part of what it, you know, the registration form or to where it was supposed to go. And it actually made sure that the buttons presented the next test because a lot of this stuff was you know, generated dynamically. Um, because of all the testing that we ended up doing, um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit more about you know the the testing tools that we did. And so, you know, we used clearly we use Plone app testing because that comes built in, and there's a lot of examples on the web, and it's you know a great way to write unit tests for the and then. With the other work that's been done with doing the robot framework test, you know, we you know, really leveraged the existing documentation on that. What we found, though, is that the, once we had this big set of tests, that it took a long time to run them, and that running, you know, having the developer, me or my business partner, sit there and try to run these tests before every commit 
you know, before every push, we just got a little cumbersome, and so we set up a Jenkins server for ourselves to actually run these tests, you know, which, which is sensible. And so you could, you know, it, the, the process that we wanted to have was that you would run these unit tests before you committed, but, you know, for the most part, what we were really concerned with was whether or not Jenkins would tell us that the build was broken. And that, that was really, because there were only two of us, it was less important to, you know, make sure that, you know, at every point, you know, of the day, there was always, we always had a green build, but, you know, the, 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 the unit test suite, after we added the permissions testing, took more than five minutes to run, which, you know, five minutes, it's not that long, but when you're sitting there waiting to do something, it really can sort of kill your flow. And then the robot test actually took even longer because it's opening up a browser, and I mean, it's really great to see that, but, you know, for just the registration, it took seven minutes to run, it takes roughly seven minutes to run these tests, and so, it was, you know, not the instant feedback that you really wanted. And, you know, you can filter out what tests you're going to run, but if you want to make sure that everything's still working, then, you know, you want to run everything. Um, and so, like I say, we, we set up the, the Jenkins Continuous Integration Server, and it's actually served us very well, as, as if you're a Plone developer, you probably know. Um, so, some of the design decisions that we made, you know, sort of throughout this whole thing, um, we ended up with a mix of using Grok and ZCML, and since we've been developing Plone for long enough that we were very comfortable with the sort of explicit nature of ZCML, it was easy to fall back on that. And because we had to write so many sort of disambiguated views from, from the content, you know, we felt that it was probably easier for just us to stick with what we know. But as a result, we, we sort of, it's a little schizophrenic because we have you know, some stuff with Grok and some stuff with ZCML, and, you know, we should probably have just stuck with one, um, probably just with Grok because we, because the version of Dexterity that we were using shipped with Grok. Um, one of the, one of the decisions that we made early on was to actually use field sets for navigation. So, you know, in a typical Plone, you know, out of the, out of the box Plone experience, you know, you're, you're making, you're adding a page and it's got the main form tab and then you can click on categorization and, you know, and so we wanted to use that for navigation because that way we wouldn't have to trigger a page load. We felt like it was, since it was built in, we could, you know, extend that. And one of the things that we ran into was that it is actually really hard to inject validation into that before you click save. It's not a problem that we can't solve, but it turned out to be a bigger problem than we had imagined. And so it sort of breaks the user expectation because it seems to them that they're moving on as they progress through a self-assessment. You know, there are different sections within that self-assessment. And so when they click the next button, they think that it should be actually submitting a form and then if you left something out, it should tell you. But it doesn't actually do that. And so you may page through 35 or 40 questions that are broken up to four or five on a page or six on a page. And then at the end, it tells you, no, that's not right. And you have to go all the way back to this other section. And so that, that, that actually was something that we, you know, didn't realize until a little bit later and that we're still, you know, ending up trying to, you know, work around. The, the other aspect of using field sets for navigation like that through, you know, tabbing through this stuff is that in some cases you'll end up with a blank tab because of the way that we have permissions and the JavaScript tailoring. And, and that really breaks user expectations. And, you know, we, we, we're like, no, it's a known bug. We know, you just skip through it. At the, you know, you still get the navigation buttons. But it, it's a little jarring when you get a blank page. And, you know, we know that as developers. And, you know, we're, we're determining the best way to move forward from there. But that, that is a, yeah. Well, yes, except it's very hard to determine dynamically what if that tab will be blank. Oh, it's been at the time. <laughs> we, we, we had actually thought about that. You know, we, we had actually thought, you know, just, just putting that in there. But, you know, triggering when to actually put that in there, it's like, you know, technically you can do it because you can grab the DOM and, you know, insert things as you need to. But, yeah, like determining exactly when it's empty, you know, turned out to be, you know, it's like it seems like you should be able to, but then when you get into doing it, it's kind of like, huh, yeah, this is a little bit more tricky than I thought. Um, so... Perhaps not the best decision, you know, and we're, we're going to work on making sure that that gets, that gets fixed, of course. You know, we, we, we've only done the initial deployment, and it's to a limited, you know, set of people, and so we can just sort of warn them that it's going to, you might run into a blank page. Uh, the other thing that, you know, we really ran into was that the complexity of the workflow started to be just kind of too much in a lot of ways, where, 
you know, the, the action plan itself has four different workflow states. And they sound very similar, but because of the way that you have to choose a goal and then generate the action plan from it, we felt that it fit pretty well, but it, it's still, I mean, it, it's, it's confusing to us even after we developed it. And so the action plan workflow, you know, goes from selected, which means that you've selected something to work on, to created, which means you actually have an action plan there and you may still be editing it, to started, which means that you have begun it and, you know, you've actually assigned a date to particular things, and then it transitions into complete. And what, uh, we, we went back and forth a little bit with, with the Knapsack staff about this, but what did, does complete mean? And I mean, it's sort of like the running joke in software, where, you know, we need a definition of complete, what does done mean? But, you know, and it, it really was a question, does it mean that one step is done? Does it mean that the whole thing is done? Does it mean that you've achieved that best practice? And so we still don't really have a clear-cut definition for that, but you know you can complete it, but we're not sure if when that really comes. And so we just have that set up so you click a button that says it's complete now. Um, and once something is complete and in, in, you know in the in, within this web app with, within the web <laughs> within this web app for an app sack means that it's not editable anymore. It's still preserved, but you can't go back in and edit it. Uh, and that pretty much concludes my talk. We can do a little demonstration if we want and have, uh, do anyone have any questions? So you can just like give us kind of a database of what you've worked with in the project. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, please step to the microphone. Yeah, or I'll repeat the question. So um, you did not use any kind of a, of a database for the registration process in that project? Say, say that. You didn't use a, a database for the registration? No, we didn't. We are using, com well, we're, I mean, we're using Plone's built-in, you know, object store for, for it. Um, no, we're, we didn't. It, that's, that's a good question, though, because, you know, some of the other elements that are involved with this, um, you know, a big one is reporting, and we are actually going to integrate an outside service that will probably use a relational database of some sort to, to store that data because we think it'll be a lot easier to run reports. But... For the registration, no, we're just using, you know, the Plone, Plone data store. Any estimate of how many users are going to be using the system within each group? Sure, yeah, concurrently or, you know, just a, they provided a list of probably 60 users for the initial, you know, they wanted to have a very limited rollout and so it's restricted to the, just those 60 users. Um, so far, but they want to extend this out. They, they want to make it, this is a regional, I think, you know, in, within North Carolina, you know, probably within, you know, a county sort of sphere, and then I think they want to extend it out to the whole state because they already have a lot of, you know, presence there already, and they want to make it regional, meaning like, you know, within the eastern seaboard, and they're hoping to push it national. They're they get their funding from insurance, and they also have demoed this to the CDC, and the CDC really likes it, and they really want to, you know, sort of promote this as a way to, you know, have child care, keep up with best practice, and, you know, continuing education is an, an important part of almost everyone's life, and in particular, I think, with, you know, daycares, especially in, you know, um, I guess the only way of saying it in, like, poorer places where, you know, they may not have you know, a big yard for the kids to play in, but they can, you know, certainly improve on, you know, how they have their play equipment set up or even just getting the kids outside a little bit. And so, um, you know, they're hoping to have it, you know, span out nationally. Yeah, Andy, I'm curious about um, the kind of um, process that you used First of all, to set the permissions uh, for people to decide which questions they got, and then uh, in the middle of the self-assessment, the branching kind of um, process that you used. Um, could you talk a little bit about, I'm presuming you use JavaScript, but I'm, I just if you could talk about it a little more, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in general, the way that you get the permissions is when you register, you answer a series of questions as to whether, what kind of childcare you provide and whether or not you have outdoor facilities and if you're you know, a faith-based organization or not or if you provide military, you know, kind, of, kind of questions like that. And based on that, on there we have essentially you know, a little engine built in there that takes those, 
the answers from you know the form dick that's submitted and determines what permissions you should get. It it also does like as as I alluded to earlier, like if you're not a home daycare, then you have to explicitly have the permission or have the role that you're not a home based daycare because it's you know it's not fuzzy logic. It has to be either one or the other, and you know you also have to include a, on that permission, for example, like you know the age of the people you serve, whether or not you have you know food, whether or not you have a kitchen on premises, and so I mean some of these permissions are you know 75 characters long, you know, and and it was uh, it was fun coming up with that, but uh, so once you once the user is assigned those permissions and they start taking you know a self-assessment, as, as they go through each field, you know, in, in the schema, there's a uh, write permission and a read permission, and that, the, you know, each one of those is, has a permission on it that will only allow the people with the correct, you know, role to actually see it, otherwise it'll, it'll hide that. But the, uh, other, the other part of your question is, yes, we use JavaScript very heavily. We use jQuery. That was, you know, kind of the, the way when we started developing this, it was, you know, Plone 4.2, I think, was, was what we had had started on, and that, that's pretty much what it's staying at this point. And so, whatever version of jQuery ship with that is, you know, what we're using. And so, we essentially just have it set up so that, you know, on document load, it looks at particular questions that are indicated in the source that we got. Like we got Excel spreadsheets from Knapsack people that said which were trigger questions, and you know which you know, what the answer would need to be in order for you to see the next one that it's related to. And so we just use JavaScript. And so by default, those questions are hidden until you answer one of the trigger questions correctly. And that, that's the majority of the logic branching that, that happens in there. And, and um, there, there's not that many paths through the self-assessment, but you, like I say, like, you don't want to present you know, breastfeeding and infant feeding questions to a daycare that only services toddlers and older. And so, you know, some of that though, that, that's fairly easy because that's just, you know, not showing a whole section because of, of the way that they have the self-assessments organized. Your list of roles yes. looked long enough that it made me wonder, is there, is, is that essentially saying that there's a need for a Boolean logic or some sort of logic applied to roles and permission handling? Maybe that that's a that's a good question. the The part that we thought about, I think, you know, was the implementation of it, and we wanted very desperately as we were developing it to come up with a better way of handling field permissions for dexterity content types. I think that it's maybe not a general purpose use case, and so it, it it's hard to say. And you know, honestly, you know, we thought it would just be more straightforward for us to complete the development, you know, generating this sort of thing. You know, I've, I've done similar sorts of projects in that it's presenting, you know, like a test to people. And it's always so tempting to think to yourself, well, I'll just write an engine that will present a question. It'll take some input and then, you know, formulate the question from that and then present a question. And, you know, conceptually it's like, yeah, that's really elegant. And then once you start trying to implement it, it's actually, you know, it takes a lot of effort to, to sort of do that. And it's generally easier to just, you know, sort of set up the logic that allows you to, you know, follow a set of pre-canned things all the way through. And, and ultimately, that's, that's what we ended up doing with the permissions is that it was probably, we, we ultimately decided it's going to be easier for us to just generate this long list of permissions and make sure that they're correct, you know, as correct as we think they can be. You know, rather than try to you know make it you know something more a little bit more elegant, but more you know, and probably more fun to do. But yeah, yeah, that that was about as far as we got. But I I, I like the idea of that. But I'm not sure how we could you know, without thinking about it a little bit more, how that could be you know translated from generic setup and into the you know roles and permissions that we have in Plone. So the other question I had was: Is any of this code? usable generally, and is it available for us to play with? Uh, it's in our private bit bucket. Um, we have not discussed with the client how they want to handle the licensure of it. Um, so we would need to, I mean, since it's in a private repository, 
I guess the short answer is no. We don't have any problem open sourcing it, but I don't know that it would be really helpful, perhaps, to as, as a general purpose thing. I, other people have written, you know, in the collective, like a way to, you know, present questions in, in this sort of format, but because of the amount of customization that was required, we figured we'd just write it, you know, from scratch for us. But, you know, I would think that we would be able to share this out to people if they wanted to see it. Um, I don't think that there's any problem with that. The, uh, you know, yeah. Okay, so a follow-up to that <laughs> is, have you considered that when you decide to start working with a client that you present them right up front with the opting out of releasing your, their code without proprietary information, but releasing code generally for Yeah, the we, we generally do. I mean, we, we generally do. And, and for the most part, most of our EDU clients are fine with it, you know. Um, and we have not actually had anyone say, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, for for the most part, I, the 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 essentially it's it's been fine to just have it you know be open source and um, you know I think some of it is our laziness in actually doing that. <laughs> so more questions? Should we look at a demo? Okay, okay, so I'm gonna I'm putting it all out here on the line. I'm gonna do a demo in front of other people. Just a second. Let me uh, do one thing. It's probably a good idea. Let me see if I can switch this back to mirroring my. Oops. Where's my mouse? Is it still here? Yeah. <laughs> But see the part, yeah. No, it's, it's right there. I just saw it. Yep, there it is. But now we need to. Yeah, the URL on the right-hand side. Yeah. There you go. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. So this is the production site that we have. Um, Currently, and we just, we actually just did the initial release of this maybe a week and a half ago. Um, it does not look so good at. So this is the back of the server from the front of the server. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, let me set this to mirror images. Uh, I don't think, oh, uh, there you go, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a little better. I don't, I don't think it was designed for 640 by 480. Oh, and I'm logged in, so let me uh, work this out just. We'll look at the the external site first, and then move on to. I'll have I'll fire up a local instance because it'll be a little bit easier to try to go through the registration process and that sort of thing. And, and so, yeah, the, originally the the site had you know basically four icons on the left hand side, and then a pretty much a blank content well. Sometimes there was a little bit of text with it, and so they really wanted you know to make it. So that people could, you know, join their newsletter. So we integrated the collective Mailchimp into this. You know, we're using a couple other, you know, collective products like for the dropdown. It's uh, the Web Codier. It's my French is terrible, so um, you know, the one that everyone uses. And you know, so we we <laughs> so we, we we tried to use Nathan's, you know, how to vet your uh, 
your your add-ons that they work correctly. So we try to use the good ones. But yeah, the, the you know the um, you know, th this is the content managed side essentially, and so the Knapsack staff has um, the ability to go in and change stuff. You know, obviously the uh, the one thing that, that that you know is that we haven't that I didn't really touch on that is you know a much more you know sort of usual plain use cases of success stories, and so. We had told the, them at the very beginning of this project, you know, maybe a year and a half ago, that you would be able to, as someone who is a registered user of the Knapsack site, and if you've gone through and, you know, done something that, you know, you want to share and that they wanted to promote, that you would have a success story. And so we said that, you know, we can set up a workflow application, essentially, you know, that would allow them to generate a document in their own folder and then it would show up in a review queue and then you could publish it and you know push it out and you know that that sort of thing and so that 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 was actually the one like oh yeah we could do that right away for you sort of thing without having to do a lot of custom development like we could get that right you know we could get that going but interestingly they said yeah i don't know we'll have to think about whether or not we want to do that i think the term workflow app might have scared them away a little bit um, so uh, but yeah i mean essentially like you just have you know this is just content managed stuff and you can see, I mean the only thing that's particularly special about it is that they always wanted the page that you're on to be highlighted on the left hand navigation and they were very specific about that and you know, that's, if that's what they want then that, that's great. Um, so let, let me fire up a local instance and we can step through the registration process and you can sort of get an idea of what it looks like to go through. I'll log out here. Okay. Okay, so we could either, I have a couple of test users set up that we could look at the web app for, or we could step through re the registration. Does anyone have any preference for it? I don't want to drag this out for too long, so. Um, Maybe I'll just log in as someone that's already set up. And so this, this is one of, the, one of the many landing pages that I was referring to. And so the five different types of self-assessments are set up. And this is governed you know, by the workflow states and the, the catalog query that pulls all these things up has to make sure that it only filtered, you know, it filters out only the most recent one that is completed or not completed and the status changes depending on what you have. And then you know, if it's complete, then you can view the results. Otherwise, you can go and complete it. Now, I mean, it, 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 it was actually fairly complicated to come up with this. And they really, you know, this MyNapsack page, which is where we are, actually, that is, right here, which should have been highlighted, you know, you know, is their main landing page and it redirects when you log in, it always redirects you to there. And that was another design decision that, you know, they felt would make, would, would simplify it very much. Once you've actually gone through and made, you know, completed a self-assessment or at least generated an action plan, you'll get, you know, below here, you'll also get, you know, the goals that you've done. And so um, we could, you know, complete, one of these, uh, let's see, yeah, five minutes, great, okay. So this, the child nutrition one we started, but it's kind of a long one. Let's see, we, I started this one a while back, and so this is screen time, and so each one of these sections has, you know, a little bit, a little bit different picture on it for what you're doing, and, you know, we can see like a giant tool tip, and so I'll, I'll answer some of these questions just for making it easy. And you saw with that one that, you know, when you actually allow screen time, it pulls up, and that, that was some of the JavaScript tailoring that we said. And so if you, you know, once you have it, yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> you know, and, and see, and, and this, is, this is what I was talking about. This is actually, you know, we're tabbing through a field set here. And so when, when you do that, it, it appears as if, you know, you're, submitting a form, but you're actually not, you're just switching a tab. And so we can, you know, I'll, I'll go through a couple more of these just for fun. Oops. 
Sorry, since we have the debug prompt on. Oh, and there's an error. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go look at a different one that maybe works. <laughs> okay, th there we go. That, that one actually works. And so, <laughs> assuming that we actually, you didn't see the error that was generated there, the, you know, the physical activity one, you, you've come to the end of it and, and it tells you, you know, it gives you this nice sort of display of each section that you've taken and how many questions are incomplete and you know and you can go back and review the section or whatever and then you know you can step through and you click you know view results which then puts you into how you're how well you're doing with your overall results and it compares to the one that you might have taken previously and then it either puts you into one category or the other as you're on your way, which is a nice way of saying you're, you know, you need to work on things or, you know, you're doing really well or great job or something like that. And so from, from here, you know, you, you can actually go back and look at, you know, how you did for each one of these or you can start an action plan. And so we'll just skip to creating an action plan. And this is another one of the landing pages I was talking about where, you know, you clicked a button that says you're going to go do something and then it presents you with this sort of text of like what you're going to be doing. Um, you know, and so you select different areas that you might want to be involved with to create your action plan. And it provides you with, you know, the, the things that you, um, the, you know, the best practices your program is not met, right? And so you could select that, that particular goal. And, and remember that a goal is a specific question within there. And so we'll, we'll just create one for now and you can, and then we'll start, start an action plan. And so this is where it actually generates all the, all the text and it gets to the, the nifty Ajax view. And so you, you and we, we could change this, you know, into some other thing. And again, we can you know reorder things and have this, the numbers change, and we can add another step. So we could we'll, we'll leave the completion date for you know sometime. There's a suggested amount of time per goal, and so this one I guess is you know 30 days in the future. And then you end up on a page, you know, once you've done that, you know, the, that essentially, you know, displays some of the things that you've done and then you can, you know, check these things off that say, yeah, I've completed these. The, you know, the, the interesting thing about it is since there's not workflow applied to those individual steps, you know, the checkbox is sort of ceremonial in many ways. What really, you know, what really solidifies is it is that you, when you click a start another action plan. And I think that that also breaks user expectations a little bit and we're gonna have to, you know, sort of discuss with the NASDAQ team how to best, you know, sort of handle this. Like, I think it should be explicit that when you click a button that says I'm, I've completed this, that it's done. Uh, I, okay, I think we're done. Yeah, sorry, um, I mean, you can continue us after, but if, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for listening to me drone on.